All right. So welcome everyone to I4J's fifth now, fifth interactive video presentation and Q&A session. And today we're with Kirk Carlson, the founder and CEO of Practice of Innovation and the president and CEO of SRI International from 1998 to 2014. And Kurt's topic today is one of my favorites. Your company is dying. Now, what do you do? So um, I love it. <clears throat> so David and Vint in their, as I would say, entrepreneurial way have encouraged me to host this series for I4J. It's, uh, it's not my day job, as you'll, as you'll see as we walk through this. My name is Ben Baldwin, as a quick intro. I'm the founder of a company named Scale Driver. It's, it's innovation consulting, but instead of consultants, we match executives mm -hmm. with innovators within an agile framework that actually helps predict innovation and speed it up so that everybody succeeds. So I naturally love topics like Kurt's, and I like using live video like this because it keeps things a little bit casual, and it's a great way for I4J group members to introduce themselves to the to the group itself to share what we're working on in an informal way and maybe even ask for help. And this Zoom video technology that, that we're using today is pretty easy to use. <clears throat> the one request that I have is that when you have a question, please introduce yourself. So remain muted if you don't mind during the presentation, then unmute yourself, ask a question, and uh, introduce yourself when you do so. And uh, the link is open, so we may be joined by some people who are not members of I4J, but you'll see everybody in these little Brady Bunch windows. And uh, it's worth noting as well that we're recording this session, so just, uh, mm. just as a note on that one. So with that said, I will turn it over to Kurt. Take it away, Mr. Carlson. Thank you, Ben, and great to see other um, familiar and uh, faces and great friends um, also here. Um, so we're gonna talk about um, uh, the world we're in a little bit. Um, you know, it's always interesting to start with a couple of quotes that are so meaningful. Um, this is Jack Welch, the world's dumbest idea is maximizing shareholder value. Shareholder value has, is an outcome, not a strategy. Um, how often do we see that violated? Um, here's Peter Drucker. Um, the purpose of the business is to create a customer. The enterprise has two and only two basic functions, marketing and innovation. Marketing and innovation produce results. All the rest are costs. These folks basically preached for their entire careers that you should focus on creating customer value. That's where all good things come from. When I came to SRI in 1998, um, it was a very famous research laboratory, uh, um, invented the computer mouse, Windows, hypertext, basically what we take uh, for granted on the PC, received the first internet transmission, and just had a long legacy of tremendous world-changing innovations, but it had been in decline for 20 years, a couple percent per year. It was deeply in debt. It was selling off its land. Um, if it had broken its bank covenants one more time, um, I don't know what the, uh, what the place would have done because there was no money to pay off um, the, the huge uh, debt that um, we had to the bank. Uh, the clauses were very familiar from today's world. Um, it had an obsolete business model. It had no value creation playbook. Uh, there was no trust in senior management, and there was almost no uh, cooperation between the staff. And when you're failing, there are lots of grudges. Um, overall, uh, the place had a scarcity mindset. That means that if I win, you lose. If you win, I lose. Um, and that's not a productive way to work um, in any environment. And by the way, Herman, um, who's on this uh, call right now, uh, was my partner in helping understand these issues and create an architecture that I'll describe uh, that turned the place around. Uh, we managed to do that. Um, um, bookings, I just looked it up the other day. The bookings when I first came were about 100 million a year. Um, we got it up to 550 million and 2,300 staff. Uh, formed five new innovation centers across America and created many tens of billions of dollars of new economic value. Uh, Siri on the iPhone being one that um, almost everyone here has used. Uh, Mayfield Ventures partner David Ladd said that SRI is now the best enterprise in the world at turning its technology into economic value. Um, I would say that's more aspirational always, but it was nice of him to say it. 
And the value creation process I'm going to describe uh, shortly is now being used uh, around the world. Um, companies all over the United States, in Japan, Chile, Taiwan, Singapore, Finland, Sweden. Um, um, the ideas are very familiar um, everywhere. And it's based on an idea of, um, of abundance. And I'm going to say why it's based on abundance and not scarcity. And how that changes um, how you think about what's possible and what you can do. So I'm going to talk a little bit about these topics. The culture comes from the way we work. People get really confused about that. They talk about culture, but the truth is um, uh, that doesn't tell you what to do. Um, thinking about how you work and how you become productive is how you um, get to turn things around. And the strategy I'm going to be talking about is based on what uh, Drucker and Welch started off saying. Um, everybody in the company should realize that they have customers and they should be constantly creating new value for them. Um, shareholder value, employee value, all the forms of value come from that. And um, it's based on um, learning and creating fast, which is the mantra of everything that uh, we talk about. And I'll come back to that. And in particular, I'm going to talk about three keys to success. Are people working on important customer and market needs? Do they have a value creation playbook, including NABC value propositions, which I'll describe? And are there ongoing team value creation forms to rapidly learn and get the answers they need? If I walk into an organization, I see these three things in place, I'm pretty sure they have a chance to be successful. It doesn't guarantee it, but at least they have a chance. I can almost guarantee in today's world, if these three things are not in place, they're going away. It's just, it's become a binary thing uh, for me. Um, in very few places that we work are all three of these things in place. I work with some of the biggest companies in the world, and you'd be amazed um, at how incomplete their innovation ecosystem is. Everyone here knows that we're now in the global innovation economy. Uh, that means there's exponential progress in almost everything, uh, intense and growing competition, uh, new business models, uh, but also endless opportunities. Everyone's familiar with attacking established businesses from the top or the bottom, so Tesla is attacking from the top, and now they're trying to drive it down and attack the established guys um, by lowering their costs. That's a proven strategy. The PC attacked the computer industry from the bottom, and uh, we know what happened there. But today, increasingly, people are getting attacked from the side. So the most uh, famous example now is Uber attacking the established taxi industry from the side. Uh, the taxi industry never would have done this. Um, but um, as we're seeing, and it's happening incredibly rapidly, uh, the taxi industry is about to go away, as we know it. And by the way, that's happening now in financial services and healthcare. It's happening all over the place. So. Um, um, just being a big established guy these days doesn't necessarily protect you for very long. Now, the good news is <clears throat> this is the best time for innovation in the history of the world. I'm not going to go through all these different areas, but every area that um, uh, we work in, SRI or I work on now, basically is open for major transformational innovations. I've never seen more billion-dollar <laughs> opportunities in my life. They're just <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> The internet's still nothing. Mobile devices still don't really work. Social media is still growing like crazy. Intelligent services like Siri will be at the front end of everything basically going forward. Um, everybody knows what's going on with the revolution in robotics. I'm gonna give you an example of that. Additive 3D manufacturing is gonna absolutely rip upside down and backwards the traditional manufacturing business. And so it goes. Um, Green energy, we still don't have the energy uh, sources we need at the cost we need. You know, we still need cheap batteries. We need lots of things that we don't have today. And you think about um, even things like television. You know, I, my team um, created the U.S. standard for high-definition television. We won an Emmy for that. I thought that would stick around for a while, and it's already obsolete. 4K is now um, replacing HDTV. And soon there'll be 8K, and then there'll be 16K. <laughs> and it just never, never ends. And I wish I had time today, maybe we can talk about this later, is what's happening in digital, in digital education is probably one of the most profound things that's ever happened in the history of the world. And we finally have a chance, I believe, to educate kids. Um, and basically nothing in the past has worked for them. Uh, this is a famous uh, curve from uh, Creative Destruction that shows the lifetime of the top 500 companies. 
over roughly the last 100 years. Um, the, um, the vertical axis shows their lifetime. Do they go bankrupt or get bought? Uh, the ups and downs are the business cycles where they last longer or not. Uh, the, the remarkable thing is how consistently uh, the business cycles are. That's number one. But number two, how consistently going, how, um, how this chart is consistently declining over time as well. And um, this says that basically if you're a big company, you last for about um, 18 years now. Uh, there's more recent data that says it's worse than that. The big companies only last for about 10 years before they get in trouble or go away on the average. Uh, they're basically dinosaurs. They just can't adapt. They optimize their business model and they can't adapt fast enough to keep up. Um, and they go away. And you know, there are lots of uh, iconic examples of this. I worked uh, for one RCA. The Kodak went from number one to out of business in 10 years. Motorola sold their um, mobility um, uh, division, kind of the heart and soul of Motorola, to Google, who immediately sold it to a Chinese company. Uh, Nokia um, went from number one to out of business in seven years. That's kind of a record in a way. And um, all these companies had enormous resources. They had some of the best people in the world, great partnerships, endless amounts of money. They just didn't innovate fast enough to keep up with the marketplace, and they got run over and they went away. Here's a quote that I like. Every CEO will give a lip service to the idea that the world is moving faster and we need to do a better job in innovation. But if you go into an organization and ask people to describe their innovation system, you get blank looks. They have none. And I worked with hundreds of companies, uh, universities, government agencies. Um, this is true about 98% of the time. If you ask a middle-level manager to describe their innovation system and they can't do it, there is none. Because who's responsible for innovation in most companies? It's the middle-level managers. If they don't know what it is, by definition, there really isn't one. They'll say a few words, but when you listen to them, it doesn't make sense. So there are, con there are consequences of this. Um, this, this is uh, just a schematic graph that shows the cost of developing products. Um, as you go along, um, in the beginning where you're doing R&D and uh, putting together new concepts, um, that's where the cost is the least. But the problem is if you don't get off to a good start there, then you just waste a lot of money and you end up with a lot of failure. And what we've seen <clears throat> excuse me, over and over again is this way the failure starts. Um, in all the workshops we've done, I'd say the average um, uh, these executives, and I'm talking about CEOs and senior vice presidents, they bring in their most important projects and um, they work on them. And after two and a half or three days, they decide whether they have any value for the company or not. And typically it's less than about 20%. I, I've rarely seen a really big innovation um, presented in all of those meetings. And um, we don't tell them, you know, they're good or bad. They decide. We just give them a framework to think about it. So I, I conclude from all the experience that I have seen that we could easily double our innovative performance. Easily double our innovative performance. I'm now working with the National Academy of Engineering to uh, look at the innovation policies that are used by the, used by the National Science Foundation. Um, those policies basically came out of the 1960s, a different era, basically built on atoms, not on bits and electrons. Um, and I think we can profoundly improve uh, results from that um, as well. What's missing? They don't have a value proposition. Right from the get-go, there's no value proposition that makes any sense. Now, you all know we've been here before. We went through a revolution in the 70s and 80s. Uh, when everybody thought that Japan was going to take over uh, the world and the United States, uh, in Deming and Onosan here, Deming of uh, the U.S. and Onosan at Toyota, came up with um, um, uh, the TQN methodology, which revolutionized manufacturing. Uh, basically, it's a, it was a better way to work. It was based on basic learning principles, and um, we ignored them in the United States for a long time. Um, and we lost um, millions of jobs <clears throat> because we didn't pay attention to them. But we finally woke up, and now everybody in the world uses these ideas. I think the same thing needs to happen with innovation. <clears throat> I wrote a book about this with Bill Wilmont. Um, we broke things down into five buckets. 
Uh, lots of ways to do this. Uh, important customer market needs. Again, if you don't start out with important things, you're not going to do important results. A value creation process, innovation champions, teams, organizational alignment. And um, the point of this was that we've learned that if you violate any of these, um, basically nothing happens. If you're not working on important customer market needs, why should you expect anything? If you don't have a way to get the answers you need really fast, you're not going to get there. If you don't have champions, uh, people with the skills to do it, you're not going to do it. If you don't put together the best teams, it's not going to happen. And if you put roadblocks up all over the place, you can't expect that your teams are going to be successful. So it's just a framework, um, but it captures um, pretty much uh, what you need to do. Uh, this is a, a classic example that we always give. Um, everybody knows this expression, build a better mousetrap and the world will be the path to your door. There have been 6,000 mousetrap patents, but basically only two of them have had real success. Um, those two. <laughs> the simple classic ones. <laughs> they get the job done and they don't cost much. Um, um, the amount of waste, basically you see any measure you want to look at, patents or whatever, uh, the amount of waste in today's world is enormous. So what is innovation? Well, the definition we like is the creation and delivery of new customer value in the marketplace with a sustainable business model. So a lot of people say the first couple things here. Basically, people have to use what you do or else um, it's, not, um, it's not an innovation. I've never heard anyone mention the sustainable business model part of it. And the reason uh, we emphasize that at SRI is if there isn't a business model to go along with your innovation, of course, it's not going to be successful in the marketplace. So we just kind of spelled it out. Um, here's an here's a, a interesting example, just a ketchup bottle turned up on the head. Uh, you probably were surprised when you saw this the first time, and then you probably said, oh, gosh, that's, uh, that's a clever idea. Um, and it captures the spirits of what innovation is about. Um, first off, um, um, it was surprising. It created new knowledge. All new innovations do that. Um, and it's a really practical solution. It's sustainable. And in fact, it's so valuable now that if you have some uh, tube of stuff that has sticky stuff in it, if it's not turned upside down, you're disappointed. It's negative value now. It's negative value if you don't um, have it. It'd be like having a square wheel um, produces negative value. Now, at the same time, um, uh, everybody on this um, link knows that there are many really bad ideas out there. One of my favorites is fail fast to succeed early. I think that's one of the classic dumb ideas. Fail fast to succeed early. Does that make any sense to anybody? Anybody here want to fail fast? Now, you know, you know what it means, but um, it's still a pretty silly thing to say. And it doesn't tell you what to do. We've got to be careful about the words we use. Innovation is really about learning and creating fast to succeed early. And once you put that mindset on, everything that you look at, that you do, you can judge, is this helping us learn and create faster or is it getting in the way? If it's getting in the way, you should eliminate it. If it's accelerating or amplifying your ability to learn, that's a good thing. So how does that play out in the real world? Well, here's the product lifecycle curve. You're all familiar with that. You start out with R&D. You try and address a big, important customer need. Hopefully, you make a sustainable impact. Sustainable, in this case, means at least you're getting a pretty good return on your investment. Um, and then you start over. Uh, the part about connecting needs with R&D is called value creation. And once you're in the marketplace, it's called an innovation. And the only point I want to make here is that connecting R&D with needs is a process. It's not an event. You've got to drive this, you've got to iterate it, and you want to learn and create as fast as you can. So everything, again, that you can do to learn and create is good news. Um, anything that slows you down is bad news. What's the definition of customer value? Um, the simplest definition you can give is customer benefits over customer costs. These are all subjective qualities, uh, quantities. Um, um, what money means to you is different what it means to somebody else. What convenience means to you is something different for somebody else. When you buy a car, um, some people um, value a Tesla so much they'll pay $120,000 for a car. Um, they happen to be very rich, <laughs> which is nice, but for them, 
for them, it provides enough value that it's worth it to them. But for most people, a $120,000 car is, uh, if you're in the Midwest with no charging stations, that doesn't make sense. Um, it's all subjective. Um, um, and obviously what that example proves, there's more to it than just the functionality of the car. In fact, there's a hierarchy of value that starts with commodities, products, services, experiences, and higher meaning. A Nokia made really good products right at the bottom of this um, value hierarchy. Um, they uh, were solid. You could drop them in the toilet and still work when you took it out. Uh, you probably could flush it into the bay and take it out and it would work. Um, but um, Steve Jobs uh, did much more than that. He made more elegant, more convenient products. He added services like iTunes, experiences like Siri, and he appealed to a higher meaning. Um, um, you know, you just, it's, uh, you're special if you buy Apple products. And that's what, that's what Tesla's trying to do, trying to make people feel special by appealing to their higher um, uh, purpose, and they can charge a fortune for it. Um, there's a lot of value up at the top of that. And we know what happened. Nokia went away in seven years, and Steve Jobs created the most valuable company before he died in the history of the world. So, so that leads us to what's the definition of a value proposition? And we have a very simple definition. What's the need, the approach, the benefits per cost, the competition, or the alternatives? Um, and the idea um, is you want to address an important customer market need with a new compelling and defensible approach including a business model to provide superior benefits per cost when compared to the competition and the alternatives, NABC. So what happens if you take one of these questions away? Does the value proposition make any sense at all? No. Take away the need, you don't know what you're doing. Take away the approach, you don't have a solution. If you can't specify the benefits per cost, then how do you know you want it? And if it's not better than the competition or the alternatives, why should you buy it? Um, and successful value propositions are uh, quasi-quantitative. At least you decide what it means, but you have to describe uh, vividly what you're trying to do. So bigger, better, faster, cheaper, don't cut it. Um, you say bigger, bigger than what? Bigger than a barn, bigger than a toaster, bigger than a what? I need to know actually what you're talking about. So. Um, we emphasize this is the starting point um, for innovations and it carries through all the way from when you're doing basic research all the way up until you create a product. You always have to be continuously answering these four questions. Um, now, unfortunately, this is what um, almost all presentations look like. We call them big A's. They're all about the approach. I just in the last month, I probably reviewed 200 proposals. They were all big A's. They were all about the person's idea. And of course, they, almost none of them made any sense. <laughs> you know, you're sitting there, you're trying to be hopeful, you're trying to help the people, and they basically start off assuming that the need is obvious, uh, the benefits per cost are obvious, there's no competition, they want you to spend uh, the next um, 12 hours listening to them describe their idea. And if you don't love their idea, they think there's something wrong with you. Um, uh, they really want you to, to love their idea. It's a, it's a natural thing. I'd say in general, about 95% of the presentations uh, we see around the world uh, look like this. They're all big A's. Um, I review lots of proposals for Singapore and NSF and other places. They're all big A's. Um, and that's not good enough in today's world. Um, we really have to be specific about what we're trying to do and why it's going to be better than the competition. And this right here, this is where most of the failure that I see around the world starts, right with the first simple value proposition. Um, here's another idea that helps. Uh, we call it the three C's. Um, so there are customers out there in the world. Um, you have certain capabilities. Uh, nobody does everything. You can do some things. And then there's the competition. And we ask people, you know, which one of those little um, uh, slices uh, do you want to be in? Do you want to be in one? Probably not. Do you want to be in two? Probably not. How about three? So a lot of people raise their hands when you say uh, which one. Three. They want to be where there's customers, capabilities, and competition. 
Well, the truth is, um, it's much better than me <laughs> where you have capabilities and there are big, important customer needs, um, and that's called the white space. And the white space uh, typically is, a, is still a big place, so what you're always looking for is the beachhead, the place you can start. The place where you're, the customers you're going after will forgive you for not having a perfect product. So again, if we use Tesla, that's what, um, that's what Tesla did. They went after Hollywood superstars who could afford a, a million dollar car. They didn't care. All they wanted was the latest cool toy and it didn't have to be perfect. It was very good by the way, but it didn't have to be perfect. Uh, they would buy the car just to have a new toy and to be able to show that they were uh, at a green identity. You're always looking for that. Where do you start? And that was particularly brilliant on Tesla's part because those folks had access to uh, publicity. Um, they could basically spread the word about Tesla. Uh, it was a brilliant understanding of wanting to be in the white space and finding um, a beachhead set of customers. So what we found um, is that oftentimes the best place to start is looking at where are the big needs and Where's, what's the competition doing? What are the trends? What are the, what's going on in the world? Um, and then I'm seeing if you can uh, put together a, um, an approach with superior benefits per cost to address that. <clears throat> this is a, an approach that um, frankly is not used anywhere near often enough. Um, that's how we developed um, Siri. Um, we, we did that um, first with uh, DARPA to develop the R&D program. That was a $100 million R&D program. Uh, we proved that there was a white space to our satisfaction that we could go after because there were so many um, exponentially improving technologies, natural language and speech and machine learning. And that if we put those together, we could, we could solve this um, you know, fundamental problem in artificial intelligence. <clears throat> and we did that by first creating uh, NBC value propositions to be able to develop that proposal. Once we won the project, we then started running um, a series of NBC value propositions to understand the commercial opportunities that would come out of that. And there were probably four or five that were going continuously. Uh, most of them didn't pan out. We didn't spend a lot of money on it. Uh, the big problem we had was um, there was no business model. We could build the technology. That was the easy part. And now, by the way, that's the easy part for most companies. They have plenty of resources. They can build stuff. But um, um, the people really want it, number one. And then number two is, um, can you make money? And it took us actually two years to develop the initial working hypothesis for the solution and the business model for Siri. We then went out and we hired those folks um, in the picture there. Um, Adam Shire on the right-hand side is probably one of the top three or four artificial intelligence uh, folks in the world. Um, uh, he was the centerpiece of the, and then we went out, we hired a, 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 a kick across the a dog, the fellow in the middle, who was the CEO. He was the, <clears throat> he was the director of the um, advanced programs at Motorola, a terrific guy. And then we put together a list of other really terrific people. Anyway, we then incubated that value proposition for another year at SRI before we spun the company out because we had working hypotheses for both the solution and the business model, but we wanted to take the risk out of it. We wanted to debug those working hypotheses before we just spun the company out. Uh, the last thing you want to do is spin the company out and get in trouble. I, I've done that a lot. I made that mistake. It's not a fun mistake to make. Um, and three months later, Steve Jobs learned about us, and he uh, knocked on our door, and he um, bought the company from us, and the rest is history. By the way, it's interesting that Steve Jobs personally uh, negotiated the deal with us. He didn't send the vice president. Steve Jobs showed up and negotiated the deal. So um, <clears throat> I said a lot about NABC, but I think it's really fundamental. The first question is um, about the needs. So it focuses everybody on the customer. Um, and it applies to every function in the company. You, if you're working, whatever you're doing, if you can't answer, uh, if you can't describe your value proposition, you probably aren't sure you're doing the right thing. It's very simple, it's fundamental, it's effective and efficient. Um, uh, longer value propositions don't work. We've tried them all, they don't work. Um, not with the kind of people we're talking about. They just don't work. Uh, the Halmeyer criteria, um, the DARPA, brilliant guy, good friend of mine, uh, George Halmeyer, 
um, he had a list that was longer, and he eventually, uh, we were on the GM science board together, he eventually said, Kurt, nobody could figure it out, nobody could remember it, there were a thousand versions of it by the time we were done, uh, what you've done here is uh, profoundly uh, more effective. Um, um, there are many different approaches to, to addressing these issues. Um, um, people look at strategy, disruption theory, uh, culture, teams, creativity. Um, currently, there are a bunch of approaches that are very popular, Agile, Scrum, Lean, et cetera. Uh, they're all good ideas. Uh, they're basically based, uh, they're basically built on the idea that you iterate rapidly with your customer. Um, everybody does that. Um, uh, what they're missing, though, is a value proposition. You know, it's, it's kind of like, the, it's like the, the, the spine of everything you do in innovation has to be built on that. And if it's not built on that, um, uh, it's not very effective. And uh, these programs are great. Uh, they teach people the fundamentals, but they don't, they don't have the reputation of creating uh, major new innovations. Um, the last point I want to talk about is uh, value creation forms. I mentioned that the core idea here is learning and creating fast. And so uh, the best way we found to do that is to have regular, ongoing, uh, multidisciplinary facilitated meetings where three to five teams stand up, they give their value propositions, and they get feedback from the team. So basically tap into the genius of the team. And the goals are minimum investment, a maximum um, a value, min-max, we call that. Um, um, spend $5,000, $10,000, prove the working hypothesis, take the risk out of it, uh, bring it to life, make it vivid so people can remember it. Um, and the thing I think that's interesting about these forums is when people are presenting, um, they, when they get the feedback, they just have to stand there and accept it. Because um, if they're arguing back, two, two bad things happen. The first thing is they don't listen. Uh, the second bad thing is the meetings take too long. <laughs> and that's uh, giving people feedback is only incremental learning. Um, most of the learning happens when they sit down and they watch um, the next person stand up and they make the same mistakes. They don't quantify the need. They don't have a really compelling working hypothesis for the business model. Uh, they haven't really been accurate about the competition. They all, everybody makes the same mistakes. And you, when you watch somebody else, you actually pay attention to it. Uh, but the other thing that happens is good is people do things that are also remarkable, uh, they're spectacular, and they become role models for what to do. So the next time, and let's say in two to four weeks, the next time when people come back and they have to present, naturally they try and aspire to be better than the person the, the last time. And that kind of bootstrapping is an exponential way to improve performance. And I, we haven't found a faster way to get people to do this. Brainstorming doesn't work. Um, uh, talking to a colleague is not powerful enough. Everything we've tried um, uh, isn't nearly as powerful as, the, as um, running meetings this way. Um, um, uh, basically, the bottom line of this on important problems is, you know, each company needs to define what it means. Um, you know, at SRI, when we were forming companies, we were, we were, trying to do billion dollar things most of the time. Uh, we didn't always succeed, of course, but Intuitive Surgical is a $27 billion company now. Nuance is an $8 billion company. Siri added about um, $50 billion to Apple. Uh, we got a nice piece of that. We didn't get 50 billion, <laughs> but we got a nice piece of that. Um, and so it goes. Um, and the reason for that, again, is that in, here in Silicon Valley, if you're not doing things that are worth at least hundreds of millions of dollars, you can't go global. We're in the global world. You can't hire the best teams. You can't work with the best venture capitalists. You don't have the time you need to be able to create the venture. Everything falls apart. It didn't mean we'd give things away. You know, if it was a smart thing, we'd license it or, um, you know, do something else with it. But, um, but when we were doing ventures, we, we had serious metrics that were based on world standards, not just uh, our nice to have. So this is a summary of you have to deeply understand your market ecosystem, the three C's, we talked about that. You have to do important customer market needs in the white space uh, with the beachhead. Uh, what are your key insights into it? Uh, what's prevented solving it in the past? Uh, that becomes the basis for your working hypothesis, both the solution and the business model. Um, that should define your competitive advantage, whether it's IP or your business model. That's your wow factor that gives you a two to 10 times improvement. And then you want to de-risk it and bring it to life without spending a lot of money before you, um, before you make a big investment. 
And so again, your NABC value proposition is the spine that drives that all together. And eventually, of course, you write a full business plan. Full business plan for venture capitalists means 25 charts, <laughs> which get thrown away the first uh, moment you form the company. Um, let me just do this one. Most people focus on interesting problems, not important problems. And um, um, as this chart says, by the time you get there, um, it really probably doesn't matter in today's world. There's so much competition. Uh, you want to focus on important opportunities. Now, when you start, of course, you don't know very much. But what we've learned is that it's an important opportunity that the landing place is quite large. If you tackle big, important problems, the landing place is quite large. You never end up where you thought when you started because you don't know enough. But you almost always end up in a good place. And the key is you still have to go through this value creation process I described, constantly developing a value proposition, talking to the best people, talking to customers, um, getting feedback from your colleagues. That's the piece. Those, those are the two pieces that people, well, the three pieces. First, they don't focus on big, important problems. The second is they don't have a playbook of what kind of answers they need that's really succinct and memorable. And the third thing is they're not doing a rapid iteration process like this. Here's an example that came out of it. Um, I think this is a lovely example. Uh, the young girl up on the left-hand side um, has MS and the kind of aids that she has uh, to, to help her are pretty primitive. Um, I wouldn't, uh, that's not exactly uh, mobility. Um, um, Given, given her level of disability. Um, in Japan, um, uh, lots of folks are building robots um, and they basically take the robot idea and they say, well, we could put that on a human being. Uh, they have to attach it somehow so that piece around the waist is how it's attached. Uh, that thing weighs uh, 20 pounds. It only lasts for a couple hours because it's very energy intensive. And, and you feel like a robot when you're walking in it. Um, and our team looked at that and they said, that's not a solution. Now, that little girl's not going to put that on every day. An 80-year-old who's got a back problem or a leg problem is not going to put that on. Uh, the problem is, how do we attach it? That's the real problem. How do you attach this to the, body, to the body? And one of our teams said, what about a Chinese puzzle? You know, you stick your finger in, it grabs if you uh, put it in the right way, and then if you relax it a little bit, you can pull it back out. Why can't we put an artificial muscle on each thigh and sense the motion of the body, and when the body moves forward, it'll grab, and when the other leg um, starts to move, it'll, uh, the first leg will uh, it'll, um, um, stop grabbing, and, they, and uh, the second leg will start grabbing, and so it goes. Uh, grab, release, grab, release, grab, release. Well, that's what that um, prototype is on the right-hand side. Um, that's now a new company that's spun out of SRI. Um, that's a prototype. Um, it will get cost, cost and um, um, functionally reduced. It'll uh, be much more convenient. Uh, you can put those pants on like a pair of pants. Uh, you can wear them. Uh, the batteries last 10 hours. Um, and um, and um, eventually there'll be designer versions of that. It'll look um, pretty slick. Um, and the market for this is literally um, many tens of billions of dollars. When you think of the number of people who have mobility issues, back problems, um, um, it's uh, basically a, a huge white space. Um, and starting with things like that young girl to get FDA approval um, is a beachhead. I mean, there's several beachheads they're going after, but that's one. That's one. So, um, Uh, one of the things, uh, just this is the end, but one of the things that SRI um, um, that we always uh, preached was there needs to be a champion today. Um, you know, when I was working with Herman, we, we avoided the words manager, <laughs> management, <laughs> leadership, um, and we focused on champions because the people who do this sort of work um, can come from anywhere. And it's not your position, it's what you can do and what you know. And we always insisted there had to be a champion that would um, identify and, uh, an important need, help them build a great team. They were organizationally responsible. Uh, they uh, acquired these skills. Um, most people when we hired straight A PhDs from Harvard and Stanford and every place else. 
uh, but they don't come to us with these skills, so they have to be um, passionate about acquiring them. And they persevere and uh, no excuses. And management role was to make sure that these folks were supported and they were given the skills needed. And our, our little saying was, no champion, no project, no exception. Um, because in today's world, it's so competitive, it moves so fast, if someone doesn't raise their hand um, and, and say, you know, I'm gonna make this happen, um, no excuses, um, we're basically, you know, you're wasting your time. And how many times have we all seen that in different companies we've run into? So in conclusion, you know, if the company's in trouble, um, uh, the thing, one of the things you have to do is um, probably you have to change the strategy somewhat um, or a lot. But the other thing is you probably have to change the way people are working so that they can be, um, they can create the value, the customer value that's required today. And as we said, um, you know, with Drucker and with Welch, um, if you're not focused on the customer and creating great value for them, you know, you're not gonna be in business very long today. And to me, uh, the basic uh, meta principle is, it's about learning and creating fast. That tells you exactly what to do. And when you walk into an organization, you can see whether that's being um, uh, uh, adhered to or whether that, uh, those thoughts are being diminished. Customer, important customer market needs, the value creation playbook, NBC value propositions, and ongoing team value creation forms. Um, that's our um, fundamentals that we look for. So I guess with that, we can um, then back to you. Awesome. Thanks, Kurt. That's, uh, that's fantastic. Quick question for you. If I'm a middle manager, I see not too many middle managers on this call, but uh, if I'm a middle manager, kind of what, what do I do? What's my first step? Is there, you know, I'm kind of sandwiched between expectations of innovation, yet maybe not the right um, risk profile, like what, what, are the, what do I do to break free and actually innovate as a middle manager? And then I'll open it up to other questions. Well, what's interesting about this is I used to work for um, RCA and GE, and um, neither of those companies uh, really taught um, my team how to innovate. And I was a middle level manager, and um, I had a great partner, still have a great partner, uh, named Norm Wynarski. Norm Wynarski, a brilliant guy. Um, <laughs> graduated two years early from the University of Chicago, first in his class in mathematics and went to the Institute for Advanced Study. A really smart guy. And, uh, and um, when we became part of SRI, um, I remember talking to him, I said, Norm, I, I, this, uh, SRI's got a great reputation, but I think it's gonna be different. Uh, they used to give us tens of millions of dollars a year to spend. I think they now expect us to earn tens of millions of dollars a year. <laughs> and I think that's gonna be different. And Norman actually said the magic words that I've already um, mentioned to you. He said, Kurt, this is just like everything else. We just have to learn. So we started doing this. We didn't have permission from anybody. In fact, the, the senior vice president of marketing at, um, at um, where we were at the Sarnoff Corporation at the time explicitly came up to me and said, we're not going to, this IT stuff you guys are doing has no future in the company. So you're on your own. <laughs> I said, thank you very much. Um, and we um, started running every two weeks. We had value creation forums. They went from five until nine o'clock at night over pizza and Coke, where everybody, including Norman and myself, stood up and we gave our value propositions. We didn't know what a value proposition was. Um, I, I'm embarrassed to tell you the kind of uh, format we had in the beginning. Um, but eventually, um, we started growing like Topsy. We didn't need permission from anybody. We just did it in our team. And we started to distinguish. Um, I, I got promoted. I, you know, I got promoted to run the whole company because we were growing at 20% per year, and we were basically taking the place over. And just, just do it. That's my advice. Just do it. I have, I have a perspective on this um, I, because I got to watch Kurt in action. And I think what, I, that, that, that positioning of – uh, no champion, no project, no exception is actually really important in the respect of what is the role of manager in this, in this kind of change of a culture. And the, the thing that I watched with Kurt was that the fundamental to his approach was to create a culture of responsibility that ties in with this no champion, no project, no exception. So all that he was trying to do with NABC, with these forums, with all that, is to put the responsibility on people to 
to learn, to think about it, to pitch ideas so that he wouldn't have to. He placed himself in a position to say, I'm not going to, I don't know enough, he would say, about the particular project that you're working on to make the decision of whether or not it should go forward. That's your job. I'm going to give you the tools and the context within which you can, you know, work together with others. You can pitch the idea, you can get uh-huh. it so that you can make the decision where there's enough value to the idea for you to keep spending your time yeah. and, and efforts on it because there are a million, you know, there's an abundance of possibilities where you can spend your time. And the task is to figure out, is this the most valuable one for you to do? But it's your business. It's your responsibility. So I would say that he created a culture of responsibility, a culture that didn't put it on management to make the decisions, but to create a management role, whether middle management or top management, to encourage you know, this kind of value-oriented thinking in everyone so that they would be responsible to create stuff that actually delivers something to a customer, to a market, and back to the company in terms of real value. But that- Very cool. Yeah, I'm just, if Herman, if you could do a quick intro, um, that'd be great. And uh, just to tell people who you are. Um, and then I'll flip it over to Steve, who I think has a question too. So I'm Herman Gear. I am actually, you know, I, I had the, the luxury and the great pleasure to work with Kurt when he first came to SRI. And so I was a witness to, you know, pretty much everything he just described. Um, and um, I'm from a company called Enterprise Development Group, and we work with companies on their innovation strategy and practices. Okay. So, Steve, I think you're you're up. You had a question, Steve Denning. Yeah, uh, Steve Denning. I write for Forbes, write books. I'm on the board of Scrum Alliance, and um, I do a lot of sparring with with Kurt. <laughs> But, uh, I mean, the, what strikes me, those sort of guerrilla operations in Sarnoff, where the top was not on board. I mean, if you're really tough, you may be able to make it work. But it's obviously much better when, if it's like at SRI, when you're at the top and you're able to drive the whole organization. So, I mean, what are the chances and what are the best ways in which we can actually get the top of these organizations focused on it? I mean, it's not just understanding it intellectually. It's, it's about actually acting yeah. in this, this. It's a fundamental revolution, a kind of Copernican revolution in thinking about these things. How is there anything we can do to uh, uh, just let the dinosaurs die? Well, well what, what's funny about this question from Steve is he spent his career trying to help people <laughs> to change the way they think of it from the top. And, and he writes a, a, a brilliant column for Forbes. Um, um, every week, uh, it seems, um, at least. Um, and I, I think um, the conclusion that Steve and I have had, one of the problems is they've never experienced it. So they don't know how powerful it can be. It's just an abstraction to them. And, you know, Steve and I, in our own ways, and Herman and other people on this, are trying to put people into these kind of experiences. And, and there are other great people that are doing that too. You know, IDO with their process, the D School over at Stanford, Alto University in Finland, they're, they're working hard to create a generation of, of younger people now, but ultimately they'll be the managers, who actually get that working this way, um, collaboratively, um, self-organizing teams, all the things, again, that Steve talks about as well, that these principles um, are not really nice to have anymore. If you want, if you want to keep up... Um, if you violate too many of these principles, you're just going to be too slow and you're not going to make it. You know, Steve Jobs was the most passionate <laughs> example of doing this imaginable. I mean, every Monday he had a review meeting, which I, I call them value creation forms, where he was, he was pulling up ideas from the bottom of the organization and then pushing them down every Monday afternoon. It was up, down, up, down. When we did Siri, he was the only executive we could find who really understood what we were doing. And it was because he was doing his homework. He was doing this every week. It's amazing, right? <clears throat> but how many executives um, know how powerful that is? I, uh, very few. So, Steve, I, we're depending on you to solve this problem. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So, uh, hi, Kurt. And hi, everyone. Hey. This is David Nordforce, um, 
I'm, I'm uh, one of the happy co-founders of I4J, and I'm happy because of all these people who are here today who make it actually worth something. If it was only me, it would be not worth anything. So I'm deeply grateful. Uh, the um, I've known Kurt for quite a while. Uh, yeah. And, um, you, you know, one thing with you, Kurt, is that you inspire people, right? You, you coach people. Everybody is worth something. So I've seen you when you walk around SRI. I mean, you, you eat lunch in the canteen with people. You, you know, everybody is a person. Everybody is worth something. Everybody is called by first name. I, I think this is a very valuable component uh, in, in this with being creative and taking responsibility. Uh, it, it is that, um, it, it, it's that you know, everybody is... Uh, an individual that works in a team. So, so, so the culture is something like, you know, we're a team of teams and uh, that this comes into it. So I think it's, it's, it's actually more than, than, than you say. I mean, it's not only what you say in your slides, it's also how you say it and how you speak to people. And uh, I can believe that when you work together with, with Herman on this, it was even more people because Herman is also all about people, right? it's, it's interpersonal. By the way, by the way da David, every one of my partners is like that. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, there you go, you know. So let's, that's culture then. And, and actually what you speak here about, about learning, it strikes me that, I mean, this method, you could apply it in schools right and for kids to learn but kids don't learn this way today kids learn uh, the way that you know factory workers should work that that you you learn to do something you don't learn why you need to do it you just learn to do it and then you 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 show that you can do it and then you get a pat on the head or you get some grade that says how well you could do it while well, actually every piece of knowledge that we learn uh, should be this way that, you know, there is a problem we're solving by, by learning this knowledge. Yeah. That we should just shut up and learn it because that's the way it is. So, so in a way, I mean, you're, you're, uh, you're treating people the, the problem they got when they were at school, you are treating with your therapy here. I'd like to hear you just say a few words about taking this outside the corporate framework and, and, and into the K-12 framework. Yeah. Well, first off, thank you for those um, generous words, um, David. Um, you know, um, um, uh, Herman knows this, some of you know this, but a big part of the value creation um, playbook we put together is about human values. Um, and again, it's, um, I think it's the right thing to do as a human being, but it's also um, because if, if you don't treat people with respect and they don't trust you, then they're not going to, they're not going to help you learn, right? I mean, they're going to avoid you. They're not going to, they're not going to collaborate with you. So it's all part of the same uh, mindset. But you, you just asked, uh, I think a very, what I feel is a very profound question, David, which is that, um, you know, when you start thinking about this as education and creation, then you do make a connection to other places where this happens. Um, and I, um, I just gave a speech a little while ago about um, work that we're doing at SRI teaching algebra. In parts of Detroit, 25% of African-American boys pass algebra and graduate from high school. And as I say, you know, if an enemy did that to us, we'd go to war with them. We, we wouldn't let anybody else do that to us. I think it's one of the most criminal things that's going on in the United States right now. I can't imagine the number of lives that we're destroying. Um, and uh, by the way, we can't have a great country if we don't solve this problem. Anyway, long story short, um, the team at SRI um, has created the curriculum to teach algebra, and we're getting um, phenomenal results, almost 100% improvement. We've tried everything else, and nothing else works. And when I, I first saw these results, I said, how in the world do we do this? The Khan Academy fails. The, everything fails. You know, 
the only thing that, that shows our, our results today is an extraordinary teacher um, who somehow overcomes all the problems with the way we teach today. And we were doing this with, um, you know, across the board, um, all kinds of teachers and all kinds of settings and in some of the worst places in the world. Anyway, um, by the way, we just, uh, we're now running a trial in Florida with 100,000 children, uh, the biggest trial in U.S. history, and um, 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 one of the districts, the sixth largest district in the United States, has just adopted this as a standard, um, even as a prototype. It's not even a product yet. Anyway, I wanted to know how the team had done that, and that started my connection to answer this long <laughs> answer to your question, David. Um, how did we do it? And it turns out um, it's a family of really fundamental uh, learning uh, principles that are exactly the same as you need for innovation. The connection is almost one for one. You have to do. You need to have immediate feedback. Uh, you need to have multiple representations because we all learn differently. You want to have mentors, not just coaches. Uh, you want to use the right tools. You want to have the right incentives. You want to have the right values. You need to focus on the big ideas. You don't want to get lost on the little ideas. And it has to be integrated into a complete um, solution. It turns out <laughs> that list, if you apply it to education, you get remarkable results. And I believe if you apply it to um, innovation, you get remarkable results. And my, my new book that I'm writing is all about that. It's going to be about that connection. Sorry, that was a long answer, but it, you can tell I have a certain amount of passion for this because I think um, if we don't save those kids' lives, I don't know what else we do. Well, this is, uh, this is awesome. Thanks a lot. Um, really appreciate it, Kurt. Um, we've come to the end of our time, so I just wanted to wrap it up really, really quickly. Um, if you ha is, there, is there a last thought that you have, Kurt, as I sort of drift past, one minute past, so I'll, I'll be uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you can always send me an email or give me a call if you want to discuss this more. I um, appreciate some of my, my great friends being on this uh, telecom. Uh, this is an ongoing discussion um, with everybody here about how do we do a better job at that. And, you know, David's forum is how do we create meaningful jobs for people? Um, a big piece of that is innovation, right? But it's not everything. And um, I, I just thank uh, all you guys for being passionate advocates uh, for uh, um, making the world a better place uh, using these ideas as well. Thank you, Ben. Thanks for setting this up. Thanks, Kurt. So thank you so much to everybody. Thank you, Kurt. This is, this is great. Um, stay tuned for the next session. We actually have Cosmin presenting on June 1st. He's switched with David. So David will be presenting on what looks like the 29th of June, but I'll finalize that in the, um, in the rosters, we send it out, and uh, Bob Cohen and uh, the She Special Interest Group will also be presenting. So, um, and I've tried to prod Steve to present as well because I know he's has he has excellent video skills. So there's no doubt that he has excellent live video skills. So um, hopefully, we'll hear from uh, from almost everybody by the end of this. For and, sure. Uh, for sure. Sorry, what's that, Kurt? Okay, I said for sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there you go. We're going to social contract Steve into this. Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day, and uh, we'll see you next time. Ciao. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.